Well, hello. Uh, hello, Runnymede. Uh, it's good to be here with you this morning. Um, although, <laughs> I, I would really love to be in your physical presence. Uh, it, this is going to be very different giving the message this morning because uh, I'm, I'm so used to being interactive with you guys, of having people ask me questions in the middle of things or at the end of things, of being able to talk directly to, to individuals um, and uh, um, ask questions and things like that. Um, but I can't do that. The only the only one I have here listening to me, well, he's not listening to me. I, I guess I'm used to having people sleep uh, when I'm preaching, but my dog is sleeping just, just over on the mat over there. Um, and uh, um, just to let you know, um, I've, you, many of you know that I've been on leave uh, for quite a while now. And uh, because uh, of uh, fatigue um, and uh, a deep fatigue, and my, I am getting very slowly better. Um, and you can tell that, uh, that I am getting slightly better because I feel like God's given me something to say this morning. And uh, um, that hasn't happened in a long time. Um, and I really hope to be back with you guys uh, soon, even though we can't be physically with each other yet. Um, yeah, but um, today I'm uh, going to share a message on the first day of Advent. And uh, we're going to do a series through Advent on Emmanuel, God with us. And um, I'm going to start by reading Matthew chapter 1, uh, verses 18 to 25. I'm actually going to get uh, Kathy Kalinga to, to read that in her uh, first language. Um, and uh, um, here she is. Hello, my name is Kathy Kalinga. Uh, today I'm reading the Bible in Chiluba. Chiluba is one of the national languages in uh, Congo. We have uh, four national languages. Uh, this is one of them, is a Chiluba. Nea lele mwana wabalume. Umwenyi kejina ni Yesu. Bwalu nea pandishe bantu bende kumibi yabo. E bibion su bivwa. Bien ze kanangu anubwa. Kukumba jeji jivwa. Maweja mwambi mukana mwa. Mwambi wendene. So kaji. Mukaji ne imite. Al, alele mwana wabalume. Mamwini kejina ne Emanuele. Momu mwane. Vijamukulu uji netu. Verse that verse twenty three uh, is is uh, it says, "Look, the virgin will conceive a child, and she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us." That's a, a quote from the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter seven, um, and I think it's such an important thing uh, for us right now. It's a very important thing for me. To know that God is with us. Uh, I think in this time of COVID, one of the things that we most miss is being physically present with friends and family. That uh, um, even when things opened up a little bit, our gatherings were, were limited to, to a very small number. And oftentimes we still had to have our, our faces covered with masks. Um, there, there is there. You know, it's wonderful that we can connect virtually uh, over Zoom and other platforms. But uh, there's something missing um, that we don't have when we uh, when we can't actually physically be with uh, people. One of my favorite Christmas carols that uh, I asked Sarah to, to lead us in uh, for worship is "O Come, O Come, Emmanuel." And I guess it's an Advent carol, uh, more so than a Christmas carol. Um, and uh, I think it's the third verse that says this. It says, O come thou day spring from on high, and cheer us by thy drawing nigh. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night, and death's dark shadow put to flight. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, shall come to thee, O Israel. So this child says it, it, he's a sign is a sign that God is with us for salvation and a sign that God is with us forever. A child who is God with us. 
That is such um, a radical idea that God would become human. And, um, and it's even more radical uh, in terms of the reasons why he come, becomes human. Some people would like to point out that in, in the um, polytheistic or the many gods a context that the Bible was written in, the Romans of those days had many, many gods, uh, the Greeks, um, and all the peoples around the, around the Jews um, had, uh, had, had many gods that they worshipped. And there would be stories about those gods coming down and taking on human form um, for a period of time. And, the, and even the, 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 the Caesar at that time, Caesar Augustus, called himself the son of God um, uh, because his father called himself uh, a god. Um, and you might remember that uh, a bunch of years ago, Tom Harper wrote the book, The Pagan Christ, where he says that um, the early Christians took the stories of the surrounding pagan religions and applied them to Jesus. Now, this idea has, has really massive problems, logically and historically, just on its own. Um, and, uh, um, but that didn't stop the book from becoming a bestseller. Um, it, it just doesn't make sense uh, that the Christians would have done that. The pagan gods, though, from these stories, they were... They were um, they were created in the, in the image of humans rather than us being created in the image of God. They were narcissistic, they were vengeful, and they were hedonistic. Uh, when they took on human form, it was always uh, self-serving, either to, to come and uh, for people to be in awe of them, uh, uh, or it was to come to punish people that they were angry at, or it was to come and, um, and to have sexual relations with, uh, with people. On the other hand, our God becomes human, not for revenge, not for lust, but out of love and a pure love at that. And this is the radical good news, that God loved us so much that he wanted to be with us. When, um, when we lived on Hector Avenue, we had a problem uh, in that we had skunks that like to den underneath our porch, our front porch. And uh, every once in a while, the skunks would spray and, and, the, um, the, sp and the, the smell would come into the house in such a powerful way, we would have to, we'd have to leave uh, for a while to, to let the place air out and let ourselves air out. Um, and, um, uh, and, and I tried in so many ways to encourage the skunks to leave and not come back. I put mothballs down underneath there I think I poured ammonia down and other smelly things. Nothing seems to smell worse than skunks, though, so they don't seem to be bothered. Uh, uh, we put a light bulb down there. I think they enjoyed that. Um, a little bit of warmth for them. Uh, I think I put a radio down there. Um, they didn't seem to mind that either. And so it was really hard to, uh, uh, to get rid of them. And I finally called uh, animal services. And uh, animal services don't come and get rid of skunks. Don't blame them, um, but they did give me some advice, and that was to um, dig around the the porch down to about two feet and put chicken wire up so that they couldn't burrow it underneath the porch uh, to get to get in or out, um, and then to uh, to seal it off, um, and then and then at the, at night to lift up one of the boards in the porch um, to allow the skunk to leave, uh, to go and forage for food, um, and uh, and then to basically stress the skunk out by not letting it back in again first thing in the morning but but to let it back in later in the day and so that's what I did and so I um, I, I, I uh, closed it all in and lifted the board propped it up so that when uh, the mama skunk uh, left she would knock the board back into place and uh, and then I would um, I would wait till about nine or ten in the morning uh, before I would prop the board back up again and let her back in and of course that stressed her out uh, and uh, did that for a couple of nights. And um, on one of the mornings, the, all the little baby skunks, because skunks only den when they have babies, um, and all the little baby skunks had kind of, kind of come up against the, the chicken wire fence to, to uh, and were, they, were, well, they were crying for the mother, and, uh, but they were so darn cute. Um, I wanted to take a good look at them. And so I got out the garden hose and I sprayed the mama uh, skunk away from the babies so I could get a good look at them and uh, and she went running down our alleyway 
and I kept the hose shooting down that way and got a good look and then she just got so anxious about being separated from her little babies that she marched right back towards me uh, right into the stream of uh, from the hose and uh, the spray and she had her tail up because she was going to spray me back and so um, I dropped the hose and ran inside but she just so badly wanted to be with her babies and it just reminded me about how badly that when we are separated from our children how badly we want to be back with our children and when God is separated from us or we are separated from him how badly he wants to be back together with us us in his presence and he in ours Jesus tells three stories that explains this to us in uh, Luke chapter 15 and the first story is uh, is about a shepherd who has a hundred sheep that he's looking after in the, in the hills and one of those sheep wanders away and the shepherd wants that one sheep back so badly that he leaves the 99 behind and goes out looking for that one sheep and the second story is a woman who um, has some coins and she loses one of them in her house and uh, the coin was worth about a day's wage so it was quite a bit of money and she sweeps the whole house and searches high and low until she finds it um, and then the third story is of uh, a father who has two sons and one of the sons um, basically says, that he says to the father that, that he would like him dead so that he could have his inheritance now. So the father amazingly gives him his, his inheritance and the boy uh, takes up and leaves with the money as quickly as he can. He goes off to a far off country where he spends and wastes all his money on riotous living. And uh, finally, he, uh, when he's living in poverty, after spending all the money, he comes to himself and realizes he should go back to his father. And the father has been waiting all this time, watching the road to see his son returning, hoping and praying that his son would return. And so when he gets a, a, just a little glimpse of his son coming on the horizon, he picks up and he runs to his son and he kisses him and he hugs him and uh, he forgives him even before the son can get out his confession. And um, all three of these stories speak of how badly God wants what is lost back again. How badly when he wants us, when we are separated from him, how badly he wants us back. And, and every one of those stories ends with a party that the, uh, the shepherd and the woman and the father all rejoice and call in the neighbors and the rest of the family in to rejoice that what was lost is now found. And it speaks to us not only of God's um, desperation to be with us when we are separated from him, but also his joy of when we return to him. God is so desperately in love with us that he sent his only son so that if we believe in him, we step into the life eternal. Now the life eternal is more about who we are with rather than the length of time. I know we oftentimes think about eternal life as life forever, and it is. But it also speaks of who we are with, that is the life eternal is life in the presence of God. Emmanuel, God with us, us with God. In Hebrews chapter 2, it talks about how we don't see the fullness of the life eternal yet. Um, we see glimpses of it, but we don't see the fullness of it yet. And then in uh, verse 14 of chapter 2 in Hebrews, it says what we do see is Jesus and that he is our picture of the life eternal. And he is God with us. But all three persons of the Trinity are involved with uh, being present to us, are involved in Emmanuel, God with us, not just Jesus. Um, the Holy Spirit is also God with us. In John chapter 14, uh, verses 16 to 18, Jesus says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you, and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him and he lives with you and will be with you. 
I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So that even after Jesus um, dies and uh, rises again and then, is, then ascends into heaven, he doesn't leave us alone. He gives us his Holy Spirit to be Emmanuel, God with us. In fact, better than God with us, he's God in us, uh, in our very being. And so that we can experience the presence of God, even though we are not physically with Jesus, because we are with the Holy Spirit and he is with us. In Hebrews chapter 4, um, the writer says this uh, about Jesus. It says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. That's about how Jesus, who knows us and cares for us and understands us, brings us into God's presence with all confidence. I love that verse. I love that line um, in that great old hymn that says, Bold I approach the eternal throne. In uh, the contemporary English version, um, translates it this way. It says, So whenever we are in need, we should come bravely before the throne of our merciful God. There we will be treated with undeserved kindness, and we will find help. Uh, Eugene Peterson translates it this way in the message. He says, So let us walk right up to him and get what he is so ready to give. Take the mercy. Accept the help. God wants us in his presence. And he wants to give us his mercy and his help in his presence. Well, how do we experience Emmanuel in our lives? Well, to begin with, the, the relationship has to be restarted. Um, we as a people, as a whole human race, um, walked away from God and his ways and left his presence. And he, like the waiting father in the story, is waiting for us to come back home so that he can forgive us and restore us. And so in, in order to feel his presence, we actually have to go to him and to ask for his forgiveness and to receive it and to, um, and to learn to live in his presence. And I know that some of you, even though you've made that step of, of uh, taking God's uh, forgiveness and his uh, restorative power in our lives, um, I know that you find experience the presence of God um, very difficult. Um, that it's that uh, I've had conversations with people who, who say, I just, I just don't feel it. I just don't feel his presence with me. Now, there's others of you who constantly uh, feel God's presence that are just, that, that feel like you, 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 you know, you're like a, a fish in the ocean swimming in, God, in the presence of God all the time and always aware of his presence. And then there's people, all the people in between as well uh, that sometimes do, sometimes don't. And I, I think that um, all of us would benefit from some practices that will focus our thoughts and emotions um, on God's presence. Next week, um, uh, Steve is going to uh, give a message on practicing the presence of God um, and give us different practices that will help us to, to step into God's presence or to become more aware. He's always with us, but to become aware of his presence. Um, I'm going to reference uh, the book um, by Brother Lawrence, The Practice of the Presence of God. Um, you may want to read it. It's a very short read. It's a small book. Um, Kindle says I could read it in an hour, although it's taken me longer. <laughs> so you can you could pick up that book and, and read it in, in advance um, of the uh, um, of next week's message um, to get the point. Um, but I wanted to talk about one way that I found uh, uh, just just lately um, in my process of rehabilitation. Um, and part of my plan, I'm practicing mindfulness. Um, now, mindfulness is uh, something that's become very popular lately in that term, but it's an old practice. Um, and uh, Google says mindfulness is a mental state of awareness, openness, and focus. Uh, it says mindfulness can be described as the practice of paying attention in the present moment 
and doing it intentionally and with non-judgment. So when, when practicing mindfulness, you usually try to focus all your thoughts and feelings on a single experience, something simple as breathing um, or on a physical item like a, a leaf or um, a common practice as a raisin. <laughs> and uh, um, it's also learning to um, recognize when your mind wanders and bringing it back to the experience or the, the item that you're trying to focus in on. Uh, and the person who was kind of coaching me in this said, said that mindfulness is more ab about bringing your mind back when it wanders than it is about the actual thing that you're trying to focus in on and learning that practice. Um, yeah, you can find mindfulness exercises online um, or, and there's a, a many apps that you can use that will walk you through uh, mindfulness um, experiences or practices. Right now I'm using an app called Stop, Think and Breathe. So you can just search for that, Stop, Think and Breathe and give that a try. Um, I really think that the practice of mindfulness can help us experience God's presence. Um, and, and first of training our minds, uh, training our distracted mind to focus on one experience or one thing and doing that with a very tangible um, thing uh, first and learning to do that, learning to bring our mind back uh, and focus uh, when it wanders. And then to, as, as we train our brains to do that, to try to focus in on the presence of God. Um, there's a, a poem that is in my uh, Celtic Daily Prayer book that uh, really reminded me of uh, um, mindfulness as it relates to God's presence or God's presence as it relates to mindfulness. It's by Kathy Hutchinson or sorry, Hachian. Um, this is it. Your love comes to me in the silence, ordinary. Like a child's treasure, I turn it over in the nook of my hand, warming its smooth heaviness. A thought of you, stony, clearly defined, drops as though down a deep well, is lost momentarily, then turns up certainty in the heart. That's from the meditation for day 14. Now you, um, in order to, you know, to, to learn to, to focus on God's presence, we actually have to, to find it, uh, as it were, in our lives. Um, God is always with us, uh, but we are not always aware of it. Um, and, uh, um, and so we need to find that time. Uh, find uh, find his presence. And it may be that we need to go back to a time and place where we're very aware of God's presence in your life. Um, it might be when you first became a Christian. It might be um, in a uh, amazing time of worship that you had. Uh, it might be in a time of, of quiet reflection that you had, that you just knew that you were in God's presence. Um, and uh, um, you, you felt it strongly. And you may need to go back to that time in your mind. You might even want to go back uh, physically to the place that you were in um, to remind yourself uh, how to find God's presence in your life. And um, I remember, uh, I remember uh, a while ago I was up at our cabin, and some of you know that that, uh, that I oftentimes uh, most easily feel God's presence when I'm in the wilderness, uh, in a canoe or hiking in the bush. Uh, and um, uh, I was out walking uh, in, in the bush, and uh, I think it was like the week beforehand, I had, had a, an amazing time of worship uh, like I, uh, um, with, uh, with the Christian community. And um, as I was walking and uh, uh, reflecting and talking to God, I, I, I thought, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, I wonder if uh, God is present right here, right now, as, we, uh, as I'm walking in the woods, as, as, as he was when so many of us were worshiping him and, and felt his presence as well. And so I asked him, I asked, I said, uh, I said Lord, are you, are you, are you guys here? Powerful, as powerful as you were in that worship service. And it was like somebody, um, I don't know, uh, turned up the brightness switch 
<laughs> on the on the lights and uh, um, and I just uh, I'm not sure I saw anything with my eyes, but I felt it in my in my uh, spirit um, that his presence was so powerfully there, and it was just an awesome thing because he was even maybe more powerfully there than he was in the worship just because I asked him, and um, we have to know. Just like that baby skunk, like that woman who uh, lost the coin, like the shepherd who lost the sheep, like the father who lost his son, God desperately wants to be with us. And so when we asked him to show his presence, the promise is that he will show his presence with us. And, uh, and usually we need to ask him to open our eyes, open our hearts, open our minds to his presence with us because he is always with us. So this Advent, I hope that you will be in awe of the fact that God sent his son, Emmanuel, to be God with us. And he does this because he loves us, and he desperately wants to be with us. In this Advent, I pray that you might enjoy God with us, and that you might live in his presence. Let's pray. Father, I, I, I just thank you. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for Emmanuel, God with us. I thank you for sending him into the world so that we might know your presence, that we might know your character, that we might know the way that you move and breathe and think, um, Lord, and that we might know you. Thank you for sending your Holy Spirit, that he would be more than just God with us, but God within us, and that he can lead us and guide us and comfort us in our times of trouble. I thank you that Jesus uh, leads us into your presence uh, with uh, great uh, uh, joy and without fault, Lord. And uh, I pray that we would learn to recognize your presence in our lives daily um, so that we might uh, catch a glimpse of what it's going to be like when we see you face to face. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, uh, this is the blessing. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.